All right, let's go ahead and just play a nice, relaxing, classic game. All of this seems pretty familiar. Ooh, I wonder if I'll get access to killing the butcher this time. The sanctity of this place has been fouled. Getting to sense something, something different. All right, I get it. I need to be testing fuel drums in Hearts of Iron 4. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Counterfactual Gaming, the gaming channel where if there's something historical, we don't do it. Today I'm dropping paratroopers on the eve of Barbarossa to interfere with the German invasion to prove a point about fuel. And that point is, even though this paradrop looks successful, it would have been even more successful if my BT-7s actually had fuel drums and armor ticks on them because fuel is a vitally important resource in Hearts of Iron. And I don't mean global fuel. I'm not talking about fuel up here. I'm talking about fuel at the local level with your divisions. And today we're going to talk about fuel drums and tanks, because as I've discovered over the past two weeks doing my research, fuel drums are... They're both a noob trap and they are not a noob trap, and they're actually useful, depending on how you use them properly. So let's talk about that. But before we get started, if you've got any complaints by about how stupid my uh, invasion of the Soviet Union is, or if you'd like to know more information about what's going on, go ahead and drop a like and a comment on the video, and I may not have a good answer for you, but I will probably have an answer on why I'm not bothering to respond to any of these German counterattacks. So, when we talk about fuel drums on tanks, what we're talking about is the module right here, the fuel drum. It adds fuel capacity to the tank and the battalion that tank is in, and it slows the tank down at a cost of extra production cost. Now, it also has an opportunity cost. As you can see here, you have to sacrifice a module to put extra fuel drums. And for most players, in most circumstances, they tend to recommend a very easy rule of thumb, which is flame tanks should have fuel drums and light tanks serving in a recon formation for your panzer divisions should also have fuel drums. And if you're gonna drop these as paratroopers, you should also have fuel drums on them so they can fight longer before they get defeated. But most players don't like putting a lot of fuel drums on their main tanks because they would prefer to have either heavy machine guns or they want small cannons mounted or they want modules like radios, or they want sloped armor for some reason, or they're doing like something like amphibious drives or things like that. But I've been doing tests over the last week because I couldn't square a number of things that I'd been seeing in live streams with fuel drums versus what people had been seeing in their theory crafting about the game or how they practically were doing things in the game. And I've come to the conclusion that the received wisdom of the community that you want fuel drums on your flame tanks and your recon tanks is okay. But the community has missed something regarding trade-offs between firepower and fuel drums in frontline tanks. And so let's talk about that. In order to illustrate that point, I want to show you two different tanks. First, we're looking here at my T-34 AM that I was actually using in the live stream the other day. Uh, it's got the uh, medium howitzer on it. It's got two heavy machine guns. It's got the additional machine gun on it. And I slapped a basic radio on it for some additional breakthrough. Now, I could change this out for maybe an additional machine gun if I wanted even more soft attack. I can't mount another... Uh, special turret on there. I could go with... Uh, I could swap these for small cannons, but just bear with me. This is sort of a basic run-of-the-mill T-34 for Barbarossa. Soft attack with current techs 46.2. But, I want you to compare this tank to this next tank. This is the same T-34, same Mio, same armor, same engine ticks, but I scrapped all those modules 
I scrapped those machine gun turrets, the additional machine gun, and the radio, and I slapped on a whole bunch of fuel drums for a reduced soft attack, in this case, of only 36.7. So the question I want to ask you is, which tank do you think does more damage? This T-34 with a ridiculous number of fuel drums, or the T-34 AM that's got the firepower and the radios? The answer actually depends on whether we're talking about this in a damage per hour mode or whether we're talking about this in terms of damage inflicted per refueling. Because as I'm going to show you in a little bit, this fuel drum tank will inflict more damage against enemy divisions before it runs out of fuel than this T-34 optimized for soft attack. But let's 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 talk about that for just a bit. Now, before I get into deep explanation, I know some people just want to see templates in action. So, if you don't care about any of the details of this, and you just want to see tanks with fuel drums doing more damage than tanks with guns on them, skip to the time code I've put below, and you could just see the results of this. But I figure most of my audience probably wants to understand what in the heck is happening that gets us to the point where fuel drums are doing more damage than guns on tanks. So let me go through that. Now, when we talk about inflicting damage on enemy divisions and Hearts of Iron, we're talking about soft attack and hard attack, but because divisions have different levels of hardness and softness, sometimes hard attack inflicts more damage or sometimes soft attack inflicts more damage. And what we're really talking about is a combination of those factors that we boil down to damage per hour. How much you can inflict every hour a division is in combat. As we can see here, this is just like a regular old combat taking place. It's There's the base attack value, but then you have like just st all kinds of stacking modifiers. You can get insanely high values. You can also get insanely low values. Like these poor Germans should have a base attack of 192.7, but they are only getting an actual attack of 90.9 because of the penalties they are facing. Damage per hour. This is what we worry about in Hearts of Iron 4 in terms of inflicting damage. And tanks have very high damage per hour values. When we talk about damage per hour, tanks are an excellent source of damage per hour. Just looking at this German tank right here, between between the improved medium howitzer, the small cannons, and the additional machine guns, it inflicts 57 soft attack and 8 hard attack per hour, beating out on an hourly basis equipment such as regular artillery, rocket artillery, AA guns, armored cars, and infantry kits. Now, it's also expensive, and in another video I talk about the comparison between artillery and tanks. But for our purposes today, if you care, like this guy does here, about damage per hour, tanks are a vital part of that. But, as we see here, fuel on hand for a division is absolutely vital. I have a Panzer Division. This is a Panzer Division that has 400 medium tanks in it. But, as you can see here, its attack value is terrible. Well, why is the attack value terrible? Well, because it's facing, in addition to river crossing, low supply, night penalties it's also just facing a lack of fuel and once we've run completely out of fuel the base attack of the division falls so badly that this isn't even a panzer division anymore this of course means that you can experience a lot of rage and frustration or especially when you don't know the game very well when your fancy expensive panzers are out of local fuel and simply cannot function now, of course, if we put those panzers back in a place where they can supply themselves, you can watch them fill up with fuel, and they'll be ready to go again. But this is a key point. All of this means that panzer divisions often have to wait for their supply situation, their fuel situation to improve or get back to normal after offensives. While it is possible in some cases for panzers to stay continuously on the attack and 
as we will see Panzers on the de on defense in the correct situations never run out of fuel. When we're on the attack, you're going to periodically face situations where Panzer divisions have to take a break and cannot continue to function on the attack. That means there the central tension in tank design is trying to balance your need for damage per hour versus the amount of time you can actually spend in combat. And that time in combat versus damage per hour is complicated by the fact that Panzer Divisions do not instantly refuel. It takes time for them to refuel. They also do not have uniform consumption. Let me give an example. This tank, labeled Burst Damage, has a fuel consumption of 2.05 because it has one engine tick. But as I add engine ticks, you'll notice the fuel usage goes up. The faster you want your tanks to go, the less time in combat they're going to have. Even more complicated is the fact that if we look at my damage over time tank here, it's got the four fuel drums, but you'll notice the fuel drum itself reduces maximum speed. In order to get back to 8 kph, I have to add 11 engine ticks, which not only makes the tank more expensive, lowers its reliability, but you also notice it increases the fuel consumption. So when we talk about damage per hour versus time in combat, it's really important that we keep in mind that that time in combat also includes time spent exploiting breakthroughs, pushing into better positions if the division is not currently fully supplied by fuel, and can include completing encirclements even if there are no enemy divisions actively resisting the encirclement. This is even further complicated by the fact that it is impossible to partially occupy a tile. What I mean by that is that these divisions right here are currently moving at 6.66 kilometers per hour thanks to mobile warfare bonus and a penalty due to infrastructure. It'll take them 11 hours to take this tile. But because Hearts of Iron doesn't have a system for partial tile occupation, if these tanks run out of fuel before they get to that tile, they are never going to make it. Or they will only complete this movement at 4 kph, the speed of walking infantry, not the higher movement speed they should get for being tanks. In Hearts of Iron 4, you do not get partial credit for making it part of the way into an objective. There are also some other ancillary factors that will impact fuel consumption. For example, logistics companies, which I am very fond of, if you take a look here, Log 2 would reduce the fuel usage of the entire division by a number of ticks. So there are different ways to influence how quickly divisions consume their fuel. There's also another aspect to this when we're trying to compare damage per hour versus time spent in combat when it comes to tank design. And that is that the main gun of a tank has the biggest influence on the amount of damage it does per hour. You can't put a fuel tank in this slot. You have to have a main gun there. So while we can add firepower to a division by slapping on cannons in these module slots, even the small cannons do not have as much of a firepower impact per slot taken up as the main armament of the tank does. Now, that doesn't mean that these smaller turrets don't matter, but what it does mean is that when we're comparing this tank to this tank, if they both have the same main gun, then we're shuffling around the smaller modules that have less of an impact on overall damage per hour than doing something weird to modify this main gun and the main source of damage. Put another way, this tank with all of these fuel drums on it still drags an improved medium howitzer into combat with its base soft attack of 45 even before we start looking at modifiers from Mio's or Doctrines. Another consideration when talking about time in combat versus damage per hour is the location of supply nodes. Now, I actually had to run a bunch of these tests in 
over the past two weeks in multiple stages because I kept forgetting that having my Panzer Divisions on a supply hub or really close to a supply hub made it much easier for them to refuel even if they were trying to attack. We also need to keep in mind that the presence of supply nodes influences this discussion of damage per hour versus time spent in combat. These four Panzer Divisions right here, because they are right next to a supply node and I can go ahead and motorize their supply, if they were defending against Soviet attacks on this tile, they would not run out of fuel because they are very close to a supply hub and they are also not overstacked on their supply. Panzer divisions on defense in proper supply near supply hubs do not run out of fuel. Panzer divisions that are trying to push into Wodes or go all the way to Warsaw will face fuel issues because they are far away from their supply nodes and they haven't taken a new supply nodes and the railways have not been converted over. This matters when using Panzer Divisions and Space Marines because you are more likely to have Space Marines sitting on defense. So your Space Marines probably don't care about fuel drums, but actually trying to go on the attack and encircle enemy divisions, you really care about fuel capacity. If there are so many variables in how fuel is consumed, especially given the proximity of supply hubs, how would I test this? Well. So I went into Germany and I created a couple of different tank designs to assign to separate templates. You've already seen them. I have Burst Damage Panzer, which is loaded up with as much attack as I can give it, given the limitations of the improved medium tank chassis. And I, just for the sake of rounding off to 8 kilometers per hour, I gave it a single engine tick, but no armor ticks. We're not worried about armor right now. We know that pure or Soviet infantry aren't going to be able to pierce it regardless of how we stack armor. Then I went through and I created a damage of time tank that scraps all those extra machine guns and turrets and replaces them with fuel drums. We're not using Mios right now because there are Mios that modify both fuel and speed. I want us to look at this in a no Mio context. But what I also did is kept the engine ticks the same so that you can see that damage over time tank is slower than burst damage tank. Now I wanna point something else out. I had a video recently where I talked about cheap tanks versus expensive tanks. And just so that you understand what's going on here, if I yank out all those fuel drums, you can see that the cost of the tank is 12.8 versus the 19.8 of the burst damage tank. Putting those fuel drums back on it makes this tank 16.8. It's not as expensive as a burst damage tank, but we need to understand something when we're talking about tank design. And that is, loading up fuel tanks does increase the cost of the tank. They aren't free. So if you are focusing on, say, going for cheaper tanks and you want to get that production cost down, fuel drums may not be your friend. And so what I did is I created a bunch of uh, tank templates to test various combinations of things. And for once, I had to not use NATO counters because NATO counters aren't going to help me here. Uh, don't worry about this drop tank template yet. But I created a burst tank template and a damage over time template. And they are both the same exact template, no support companies. We're not, I don't want support companies messing with the numbers here. I just wanna compare tank division to tank division. But damage over time tank division only allows damage over time tanks in it. And burst tank division only allows burst tanks in it. We will look at recon tanks and flame tanks later. Right now, we're just I just want to look at the performance of these tanks. Now, we are also going to be using mobile warfare as our doctrine, buffing the tank side through the Blitzkrieg path. Uh, we're not doing uh, modern Blitzkrieg or desperate defense. Um, I don't actually think that any of these buffs are going to matter a whole lot. I just want the Panzer Divisions to have enough org to do what they need to do. 
And in order to measure the damage that these tanks inflict before they run out of fuel, I'm also not going to use supply motorization in this case, just to simplify the test and uh, further highlight the contrast we have between our two different kinds of tanks when they're not within refueling range of a supply hub. Because remember, you can have adequate supply but not be receiving fuel. Now I want to point something else out. Uh, if this was a real game or a multiplayer game, I would also have better generals, better setup divisions, um, and I will later in the video talk about the importance of stacking modifiers on Panzer Divisions and how that might change the way you look at this. But for the purposes of this test, I just want to measure the amount of damage tank A does on a tank of gas versus the amount of damage tank B does on a tank of gas. So the way we're going to do this is I've got my two different kinds of German divisions here, my burst tank and my damage over time tank divisions. And I'm going to drive them here, and I've got Soviet divisions sitting on the tile just west of Warsaw, right there in the plains where the tanks can get at them easily. I want to drive my tanks just far enough away from my supply hubs that they will not necessarily be getting the benefit of those supply hubs and have them attack into the Soviet divisions while the Soviet divisions last in. And each each group of Panzer divisions will fight until they run out of fuel, then I will manually stop the combat and examine the results. No air power involved. Uh, the weather will be the same for uh, each test, so it, uh, even if it's raining or muddy, it will be raining and muddy for both of them. And with all of these factors controlled for, we'll see which kind of tank does more damage per tank of gas per refueling. Okay, we've made contact with the Soviets. Let's go ahead and order Sukhov to last stand. Now, we have basically a full tank of gas here, and we're going to watch this current fuel meter decrease as the tanks attack. Okay, that's as low as it's going to get. So we manually stop the attack, increment for an hour, and then we've got our results here, right here. Okay, we're going to do that again. Only this time we're going to use the damage over time tanks. Same conditions. And we're going to roll. Tag to the Soviets. Or Zukov to last stand. Now I might need to refresh the last stand on Zukov because if we take a look at our fuel tool tips you'll notice I have a lot more fuel that I can utilize. Okay, We're burning through the fuel, burning through the fuel, burning through the fuel, burning through the fuel, and that's as low as it's going to get. We cancel the attack, increment it for an hour or two, then we look at our results. All right, so let's put these battle results side by side and examine them carefully. So the first thing we notice is that the damage over time tank divisions inflicted significantly higher losses on the Soviets than the burst damage tanks did. The extra fuel drums on the tanks allow them to drag out the fighting for longer and inflict more casualties per refueling than the burst damage tanks. In fact, the Soviets lost around 50% more manpower and equipment against the damage over time tanks than they did against the burst damage tanks. This is despite the substantial firepower advantage enjoyed by the burst damage tanks. Now, because the combat took longer, German divisions with damage over time tanks also lost a tiny bit more equipment themselves. If we collate all that information together, we see that the damage over time tanks clearly inflicted more damage 
against the Soviets per refueling than the burst damage tanks inflicted. They also lost more equipment, but they had a better damage inflicted versus equipment loss race ratio than the burst damage tanks did. Now, these losses inflicted versus losses taken ratios look a little weird. They look a little weird because we don't have all the other factors you would normally use in an, in an armored assault. We don't have air power involved. We're we're not stacking field marshals and generals. We're not doing certain kinds of other things. We don't have support companies in the mix. So they look a little odd, but this just shows you the effect of the fuel drums. So why do the fuel drum damage over time tanks perform so much better in this context than the burst damage tanks with all the extra firepower? Well, it's because they have more combat endurance. Like I said earlier, we shouldn't be thinking about fuel in terms of distance traveled so much as hours spent in combat. The burst damage tank can only inflict damage for 48 hours worth of combat endurance, while the damage over time tanks can inflict damage for 109.5 hours of combat endurance. Furthermore, because of the way fuel shortages affect combat performance, you don't just fight at full strength until you run out of fuel. You start doing progressively less damage as your fuel reserves exhaust, which means the damage over time tanks spend more total hours at full strength and with full bonuses compared to the burst damage tanks. But this comes with a whole bunch of caveats. I want us to look at the supply map for just a little bit because supply isn't consistent. What I mean by that is the supply situation at one time on one tile is going to be different than the supply situation in another tile or in the same tile at a different time. For this test, I specifically put those Soviet divisions right here west of Warsaw. I did it in planes, and I did that because I wanted the tanks to inflict full damage without worrying about things like forests and rivers and such like that. But... When we look at Germany's supply situation, we can see that there are several supply hubs very close to this area. Depending on how motorized supply is, depending on proximity to supply hubs, and even depending on rail connections to supply hubs, the distance at which your tanks can operate from a supply hub while remaining fairly well fueled can be highly variable. In fact, if we look at the wiki here for just a second, there are several factors that determine the range at which supply radiates out from a supply hub. And the eagle-eyed among you will have noted that uh, increasing the level of infrastructure in the area helped just as well as increasing rail connections to the hub. But because infrastructure and rails can also be damaged by combat, not just from bombing, but your infrastructure can get torn up just by virtue of regular old land combat. The actual tiles to which supply is flowing and how much supply is flowing to individual tiles can vary wildly. What this means is that the usefulness of those fuel drums is very context dependent. If we go over here and we look at the supply networks in France, West, Western Germany, and over here in Benelux, you can see that as long as you're making at least some effort to take some supply hubs that are almost on all these French VPs, you should have very little problem keeping Panzer Division supply. But on the other hand, if we take a look here at the Soviet Union and we look at their supply network, there are some places where there are supply hubs fairly close together and there are some that are placed in really weird locations, making it much harder to keep divisions fueled as you push past Kiev. It's also worth pointing out that there are some supply hubs in the Soviet Union that are not even connected properly to their supply network. Uh, the supply hub here to the north of Gomel being a good example of a supply hub that looks good on paper, but because it connects to Gomel near that river line, any fighting on that river line is going to effectively isolate this supply hub if you don't connect it up to Smolensk or Moscow. So depending on your situation, that combat endurance we're talking about might be minimal or you might not even notice it and i did mention earlier that def that defending makes a big difference here we take a look at both of these panzer divisions if the soviets were attacking here and trying to attack where my panzer divisions are sitting right now 
Short of heavy duty logistics bombing, these Panzer divisions should be able to remain in supply because they're literally right next to a supply hub. Those of you who love playing the Soviets will no doubt prefer defending Kiev with armor because Kiev is literally a supply hub. As long as the rail connections can bring supply in, Panzer divisions or Space Marines sitting in Kiev will remain fully fueled. Fuel drums don't help you in those circumstances. But when you are facing any kind of critical drop-off in fuel supply, combat endurance matters. Look at it, it's very clear that the damage over time tank design has more than twice the combat endurance of the burst damage tank. And even though it has less firepower, because it has more combat endurance, it will inflict more damage on enemy divisions. But what about that trick of using recon and flame tanks as fuel carriers for the rest of your division? Now, if you don't know what this trick is, it's essentially you take light tanks or medium flame tanks, I'll show you in a second, and you slap on a whole bunch of fuel drums, you set the speed to whatever you want your speed to be, and you assign these tanks to armored recon companies in your divisions. You tie up a support slot, but you get a bunch of extra fuel capacity while doing so. Because recon and flame tanks have nerfs to their combat stats, they aren't particularly useful in terms of loading up with firepower, but, the stat nerfs do not impact their fuel capacity. So again, you could just like, you can slap on a bunch of fuel drums and you've got yourself what is essentially a support vehicle carrying extra fuel. How does that actually work out in practice? Now, a lot of people actually like doing that. So what I did is I took my burst damage template and my damage over time template and I created same exact templates, but I added recon and flame tanks to them as support companies made sure that I ordered them to only use the right kind of tanks and the equipment, and took a look at their stats. Now, it's important to keep in mind, they use fuel themselves, so you are also increasing your fuel usage even as you increase your fuel capacity. As you can see here, the burst tank division now has a fuel usage of 30 and a fuel capacity of 1849.6. Uh, the damage over time tanks, have a fuel usage of 30 and a fuel capacity of 3249, which gives us around 54 hours of combat endurance with the burst damage tanks and 108 hours of combat endurance with the damage over time tanks. And if we look at the damage over time tanks with flame and recon, their endurance actually drops to 107.5 they actually lose a tiny little bit of endurance because the increased fuel consumption is not offset by a corresponding increase in fuel capacity. All of the tanks already have four fuel drums on it, so adding more tanks with extra fuel drums, unless they were very fuel efficient tanks, isn't going to improve their endurance very much. But even with these stats, burst tanks with flame and recon don't even get close to the endurance of damage over time tanks with flame and recon or without flame and recon for the burst damage tanks you get roughly a 12 percent increase in combat endurance by using flame and recon tanks in this way and to be perfectly honest i think that's a solid way of doing things the community's received wisdom on this topic is spot on uh, the, the cost increase is well worth the extra endurance. So let's boil this down into a couple of points that can help guide our design of both tanks and tank divisions. First, we should ignore tiny increases in attack from weak modules when designing tanks. Now, here's what I mean by that. If we take a look at the burst damage tank again, we'll note that it's got as many secondary turrets on it it can fit, but I also slapped on some additional machine guns for tiny increases in soft attack. While this does increase the soft attack of the tank, at least one of these machine guns would, would probably be better turned into a fuel drum, and the other one would probably be better turned into something else that you might want, like armored skirts or maintenance hatches, or even if you're doing some kind of a sloped armor kind of a thing. The amount of additional soft attack we're getting from those additional machine guns is so tiny compared to the utility of fuel drums that you, you really shouldn't be using them at all, unless you just literally have nothing else to put there. Two, uh, defending Space Marines 
don't generally need fuel drums. When you're defending near supply hubs, which is where you're going to want to put your Space Marines anyway, as long as they start combat within the, ra the supply radius of that supply hub, they should be able to remain fueled regardless of how long they stay in combat. Now, again, there are going to be some exceptions as infrastructure gets destroyed, so on and so forth. But generally speaking, when you're fighting on defense, you're able to organize your forces in relation to your supply hubs much better. You're not pushing past the range of existing supply hubs into enemy territory. So the relative utility of extra fuel drums goes down. Tank destroyers and space marines will probably benefit much more from things like sloped armor. They'll benefit from secondary turrets and they might benefit from other modules that make the tank more useful maybe even dozer blades, than the utility they would get from a bunch of extra fuel tanks. Three, the greater the distance between supply hubs, the more useful stacking fuel drums becomes. If you're fighting in Western Europe, chances are you probably don't need to worry about supply hubs and fuel drums as much as, say, pushing into the Ukraine or pushing past Gomel or Smolensk on the Eastern Front. And I shouldn't have to say this, but just for the sake of completeness, when we're talking about fighting in North Africa, when we're talking about fighting in China, when we're talking about fighting in India, you might want extra fuel drums on those tanks simply because supply situation is always terrible on those fronts. Also, as a side note, you should probably be dropping airborne light tanks with a lot of fuel drums since even if they take a supply hub it probably won't be connected to the rail network and will not be functioning until relief forces catch up to them every extra hour paratroopers with tanks can remain in combat as another hour you have to rescue or relieve them with your other forces for we should remember that panzer divisions with fuel problems are always effectively pierced it doesn't matter how good your tanks are, if they are suffering from fuel-related penalties, their armor rating will be nil or effectively nil, and you won't even need AA guns to pierce them. And a fifth point, for those of you who play multiplayer, stacking firepower matters more for you guys because human players stack a lot more modifiers. We're talking both on offense and defense. For people playing multiplayer games, you might just care literally about taking a single tile and pushing the enemy off of it so that you can advance a little bit and make some progress. In those situations, having enough firepower to reinforcement meme the enemy because you're knocking defending divisions out of combat faster than they can reinforce will matter more. Having said that, uh, because people mod their multiplayer games in so many different ways, depending on how your game is modded, fuel tanks and fuel drums might actually still be useful to you. But I'm going to assume that top tier multiplayer Hearts of Iron players are focusing much more on the first 10 hours of combat having enough firepower to dislodge defending divisions. And that about wraps things up. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, put a like and a sub on it and put any comments below on how poor you think my division's performance is as it tries to desperately drive towards Minsk on a single tank of gas. I'm not quite sure what I want to do on my next video. I've had some folks asking for more naval or more air power stuff. We might be getting into some of that. Um, I'm also thinking about a couple of other things that I can do related to some of the mechanics in Arms Against Tyranny. But when I figure all that out, I'll let, I'll let the community know. I'll put up a community post about that. And before we go, I just wanted to thank my members for their support of this channel. I really appreciate it. If you want to know more, you can click on the join link and see what members get. It's actually almost sunny today where I live, and my cats are not jumping in my lap, even as these tanks are slowly, slowly running out of fuel as they push towards means. But I hope everything's fine where you all are, and I hope you have a pleasant day.